Please remain standing, if you would, for the reading of God's Word. Our scripture this morning comes out of the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The scripture that is uh, included there in your bulletin is incorrect, and so you're welcome to either listen along or follow along there in the pew Bibles in front of you. Again, Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, pour out your spirit upon this, your word, and to make it be for us the word of life that we might be people of life. And now, O oh God, hide me behind your, behind your cross, that your message of love and grace might shine through for the redemption of the world. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I suppose that I was like most young children. I didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up. I had thought of doing a lot of things, uh, but even in the high school, I wasn't, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do whenever I grew up. Now, I've shared with you that I preached my first sermon when I was 12 years old, uh, just as a, as a preteen boy and had an opportunity to preach multiple times every year from then on. But there was one thing that I knew that I would never do. One thing that I put my foot down and said, I will never, ever, ever be a missionary. I will never be a missionary. I will never go to the mission field. I was so scared. I was so scared that God was going to have me do something crazy and foolish like be a missionary. And so when I was a junior in high school, the, the, our youth group went, they decided that they wanted to go on a mission trip. Now, I was one of the leaders of that, of that youth group. Well, likely all of us were leaders of that youth group. We only had five or six kids in that small youth group in that small United Methodist Church. But they decided that they were going to go on a mission trip. And I put my foot down. And I said, I'm not going. Obviously, it, well, it was obvious to everyone that I, was, that I was missing from that mission trip. When they came back from that mission trip, I didn't want to hear anything that they talked about because I was bound and determined. I actually made a vow that I would never, ever be on the mission field. I would never, I would never be involved in missions. It scared me so much. Well, you know part of my story. The next year, my senior year in high school, God called me to be a United Methodist pastor. And so I, I followed that call. I, I, I gave in to God's call in my life to, to be a United Methodist pastor. So I went on and got my undergraduate degree, went on and went to seminary. And then I was appointed to my very first church. My first church was in Woodward, Oklahoma. And that church in Woodward had been founded in 1979 to reach the oil field people that were moving into Woodward. You remember the late 1970s and 1980s? There were boom towns that were popping up all over western Oklahoma and the Texas panhandle. Woodward was one of those towns that had exploded in population. And so the, you remember back in the day, maybe, you remember that, that we thought that that boom was going to last forever. And so they started a church. The Methodist, start, Methodist Church started a, a third Methodist church there in Woodward, Oklahoma, designed to reach the oil field folks that were moving in into that community. And at the very heart of who that church was, it was a mission-loving church. God has an incredible sense of humor. I had vowed that I would never be involved in missions and God sent me to a church that at the very core of who they were, they were missionaries at their heart. In 1981, that church took a mission trip to Bolivia. It was one of the very first short-term mission trips that had been taken, really, of, by United Methodists, really even across the world, but as, uh, across the United States, but especially out of Oklahoma. And they went on a mission trip to Bolivia. Today I'm wearing a stole that comes from Bolivia. 
because of the special relationship with New Horizon United Methodist Church in Woodward, Oklahoma, and Bolivia. In fact, the last president of Bolivia, the former president of Bolivia, in his inaugural address, he made it a point to, po- to, to highlight the importance of the United Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church in Oklahoma, because he said the United Methodist Church in Oklahoma had saved his country from collapse. It all came out of this small little church in Woodward, Oklahoma, in which I was the pastor. And so I didn't have any, I didn't have any choice but to be involved in missions. We took a number of mission trips when I was the pastor of that church. One of the, I think it was the last mission trip that we took. We took to Honduras. We went to Honduras on our mission. Uh, we had been to Puerto Rico. We had been to multiple areas in the state. We had, we had been really all over the United States as well. And this was a, this was a big trip for that church. It was, a, again, a relatively small church, a church of around 70 or 80, right about the size of church that I grew up in. And so we got there in Honduras. We flew into Gusagapa. I don't, you likely have not been to Honduras. Tegucigalpa is the most dangerous airport in the United States because it's, it's, it's surrounded by mountains. And you can go online and, and, watch, and watch videos of these airliners that are, that are coming into Tegucigalpa. You make three really hard turns. I was sitting on the left hand of the plane, left hand side of the plane, and I swore that wing was about to hit the, hit the ground whenever we made that last bank. And we fi- the, the pilot finally leveled it out. And immediately when he leveled it out, we hit the ground and he put on the brakes and we stopped right at the very end of the runway. And as we were taxiing back to that open-air airport, you could see that there were burned-out airplanes all all along the side of the runway. We got off the plane, and there were military officers all around, all with large machine guns. And I thought to myself, oh my, what have I done? This is why I didn't want to go on mission trips. (laughs) The next day, we got up and and attended church at at that Methodist church there in the community in which we were serving, and it was a wonderful day of celebration. It was a wonderful time of, of, of worship. In fact, that day they were uh, baptizing a young child, and the, and the pastor, Randy Webster, had asked, I had known Randy, and uh, he asked me to participate, and so I had the opportunity to, to help baptize a young child in that church, and it was, it was an incredible day of ministry, and the next couple of days we worked hard. We were working on... Um, converting some uh, one large Sunday school classroom to three different rooms, and then we were adding a, a two restrooms on the side of the church. And so we worked hard, lots of, lots of mixing concrete and lots of pouring concrete and, and, and stubbing out plumbing and all, all kinds of things. We worked really, really hard. Tuesday uh, of that week was a it was scorching that day. We were, we were incredibly exhausted. It was really, really hot. And so after lunch, we ate, we ate lunch there at the church, and then we went back to our hotel. I guess you could call it a hotel. If you've been to some of the, some of the very impoverished nations in Latin America, you know that the hotels are not necessarily what we might consider five-star hotels at all. We, had, um, we didn't have air conditioning at all, but we, we did have a bed. We did have beds, and we did have running water. It was not hot water in the mornings, but we did have, we did have running water. It was a two-story hotel, and if you've been to Latin America, you've likely seen these buildings all over that, that they leave typically the top floor unfinished. And so it looked as though that there was going to be a third floor that was going to be added, but it was unfinished, and so you could just simply walk up to the roof. And so we're sitting there, in our, sitting there in our rooms trying to cool off, and we start hearing a commotion out on the street. We were just a couple of blocks off of the, really off of the wharf area there in that, in that community. And so we went up to the roof because we couldn't see it from our second story window. So we went up to the roof of that hotel, and we saw a large gathering of students. And they were, they were beginning to chant, and they were beginning to shout, and they were, they were holding signs. We had no idea what their signs said. We didn't speak Spanish. We didn't read Spanish. And so uh, we sent one of, our, one of our mission team down to the front desk to ask them what was going on. And so they, they, they informed us that the schools had let out that day, and there was a large student protest, and they were protesting the, the war in Iraq. 
that the United States had just, had just started. And so there we were with a, with a, with a bunch of um, small town people from western Oklahoma in the, in the middle of a Latin American country and they were protesting us. And I, I made up my mind right there, I didn't want to be there. <laughs> I didn't want to be there at first. I was, I was scared to death. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't exactly sure how safe it was. I had no idea. I mean, it was, it was very obvious all around town that we were there. Even though it was a town of about 40,000, uh, it, was, it was known all across town that there was, a mission, there was a mission team from America that was there. So everyone in town knew that we were there. So I was scared. And then my fear turned into anger. Who are they? Who are they to be protesting me and my country? And I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to help those people out anymore. I knew that I was going to be stuck there for the next three or four days doing work. The rest of the story is that we, we did stick it out that week. In fact, the next evening, the next evening, we had one of the most one of the most beautiful times I've ever had on a mission trip. We had, um, the, in fact, I, I took not only the church in Woodward, but also a little church in Quinlan, Oklahoma. There's nothing in Quinlan other than the church made up of a bunch of ranchers and farmers. And one of the guys that was on that trip, he was, a, uh, he was quite a cowboy, and he was a, he was a great roper. And he found a, found a little rope, and he fashioned, he fashioned a lariat rope out of a little rope. And there were, there were 30 or 40 kids there at the church that Wednesday evening. And he had, he had such a beautiful time. Uh, he was twirling the rope and doing all kinds of rope tricks. And the kids were just, and they were just infatuated with him. It was a beautiful, beautiful time of ministry. In spite of us really not wanting to be there, in spite of, in spite of my vow years before that I would never be part of a mission. You know, there are hidden idols in our lives. Even though I had given my life to ministry, and I had said, God, I will go wherever you send me, in the United Methodist Church, in the United States, really only in the state of Oklahoma, God, I'm yours. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. There are hidden idols in all of our lives. Idols that go even deeper than the idols that we've been talking about, idols of, of romantic love and money and possessions, money, or, uh, idols of success, and, and even deeper idols that are hidden even deeper than the, than the idol of power. There are systemic idols, cultural item, idols. There was a historian that, that wrote a a brief synopsis of the history of America, and, and he said that there really have been three movements of our culture in America. He said the first movement was, was that um, the, if, if you ask an American who they were, they would first tell you that they are a Christian. This country, the very first who came to this country, were, they were trying to avoid religious persecution in Europe, and they came here because of their faith, the very first people. And so that understanding permeated uh, really almost the first century, almost the first century of this, country's, of this country's history. If you ask someone who they were, they would tell you who they were. Sometimes they would tell you, I'm a Presbyterian, and they would tell you, I'm a Methodist, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, but it always went back to their faith, who they were. Their faith defined them. The second movement in American history, according to this historian, was was, a, was an era of patriotism. It really began after, after the Civil War. It began to ramp up more after World War I, but especially after World War II. You ask an American who they were, and they would say, I am an American. And their patriotism and their country came first in their life. And we saw it all over, all over, all over the United States. We were proud to be Americans. And then finally, According to this historian, the last movement in our culture has been one from no longer patriotism, but now if you ask someone who they are, what will they say? They will tell you their name. Because we are an individual. We believe in personal freedom. We are who we are. We are God's.
That kind of idolatry. That kind of idolatry, either patriotic idolatry or idolatry of self, or idols that are hidden so far deep down that we often don't recognize them. And so we may think to ourselves, well, if we just had more religion, if we just had more religion, then that would solve all of our idolatry. But I suspect that, well, I've recognized and I've seen even in our religion we have have idols. Idolatry is so pervasive that it has, that has made, that it, that, that idolatry has made inroads even into our, even into our religion. There are some who look at their faith, and their faith is, I mean, the ultimate aspect of their faith is their doctrine. There are churches that have doctrine after doctrine after doctrine, and those doctrines are so narrowly defined that that doctrine has become their God. There are others, there are others that believe that their morality is their God. They don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with women that do, and so they believe that they are so moral that morality has become their God. Religion, yes, even religion can become idolatrous. And all of these things, idolatry of patriotism, idolatry of self, idolatry of religion, all of those things are thrown in the mix in the story of Jonah. We're continuing this series looking at the idols of our lives. Again, many of these idols are clearly evident to us, but there are some who are, that are so deep and so hidden that we don't recognize them. In Jonah's story, there were idols in his life, no doubt. Jonah was a faithful Hebrew man, a man who was incredibly faithful, and uh, a, a man who was no doubt following God, and he felt a call just like many of us have felt a call before. And God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Well, let me give you a little bit of background on what, on, on, uh, what Nineveh was. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. Assyria was the most powerful nation of that time. They predated the Babylonians. They were, they were ruthless. They were absolutely ruthless. And they were knocking on the door of Israel, the northern, the northern kingdom. This is during the divided kingdom period. In the divided kingdom period, you had Judah to the south and Israel to the north. And and so Assyria was knocking on the door, knocking on the door of the of the northern kingdom. And and, and so God called God called Jonah to go into the very heart of the enemy and to go and to and to preach to them that they might repent. And Jonah uh, he, he, he ignored that call. It was not just that he ignored that call. He heard that call. But instead of going east to Nineveh, he went west, jumped on a ship to Tarshish, and he began to sail as far away from Nineveh as he could get. As the story goes, and this is the most infamous part of the story, the part of the story that we, I mean, this is the reason that we tell this story to children. As, it, as, as the story goes, he's on the ship and a large storm arises on the ship and the, the captain of the ship is wondering why in the world, I mean, wh- what, what have they done? Uh, they're all going to perish and so they began to throw things overboard and they began to, they began to question all the other passengers. Have, have you brought this calamity upon us? And finally, Jonah knew exactly what it was. He knew that he had been He had been running from God's call upon his life. And so Jonah went to the captain of the ship and said, throw me overboard. Better that I die and drown in the sea than the rest of you. You all are innocent. I am the one. I am the one uh, that is the cause of, of all of this calamity that has come upon us. And so finally the captain relented and the captain threw Jonah overboard. And you know, you know what happens next. This fanciful ter- tale, this, this, uh, this magical type of tale arises. A large fish comes up and swallows Jonah whole. And Jonah spends three days in the belly of that fish. And it was in the belly of that fish that, that Jonah recognized that when there's a call upon your life, God will not give up on that call. I think that's one of the things that, we, uh, that I want you to hear if there, is a, if there is a call of God upon your life, God will not give up on that call. He will continue to pursue you even into the belly of a fish. 
And so we're there in that belly of the fish. Finally, Jonah relented. And finally, Jonah recognized that God had a call upon his life, and there was no way that Jonah could ever run from that call. So after three days, after three days in the belly of that fish, it appears as though Jonah got tired. It also appears that the fish got tired of Jonah, and he spit him out onto the, onto the, onto the shore, and Jonah made his way to Nineveh. The Scripture says uh, in Jonah chapter 3, it, it, it says that, that Nineveh was so large, it was a three days journey across, across that city. So Jonah went one day journey into the city, into the very heart of the city, and he stood at the street corner, and he began to proclaim God's judgment upon the Ninevites. And what do you know? What do you know? These Ninevite people, these who were, who were so opposed to God, these who had turned their backs on God, these who were violent people, they, they repented. And they confessed their sins, and they turned to God. And so you would have thought, as chapter 3 comes to a close in verse 6, or in verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And I would have thought that there would have been a verse 11. If this was a Disney movie, this, there would be verse 11. And verse 11 would simply say, and, jo- and Jonah returned home rejoicing. That'd be a happy ending to the story, but that's not how the story goes. We find in chapter 4, it continues, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relented from disaster. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah's hatred of his enemies was more powerful than his love of God. Jonah's hatred for his enemies was even more powerful than his will to live. See, those kinds, of, those kinds of idols are hidden from us. They are deep down inside of us. Those idols very rarely they very rarely, they rarely, very rarely come up in our lives. It's only when, be, when disaster begins to come upon us, it's only when stress levels become, uh, come upon us, do those kinds of idols begin to, begin to rise up in our lives. When the stock market turns, a, has, a, has a deep and, and unrelenting downward turn, then we begin to see the idols in our lives. When a pandemic comes upon us, we begin to see the idols in our lives. When marriages fall apart, we begin to recognize the idols in our lives. They begin to percolate up. It's astounding. It's astounding that that when, when Jonah saw God's forgiveness upon these people, he would rather die than live and see it happen. I want to read to you a couple of chapters, or excuse me, a couple of paragraphs, not chapters, a couple of paragraphs out of this book. I've, been, I've, I've gotten a lot of ideas uh, from in, this, in this series from this book. It's, it's entitled Counterfeit Gods. It's by Tim Keller. Listen to what Timothy Keller says. Idolatry has distorted Jonah's thinking. He goes on a tirade that most people would think insane. How could Jonah be furious that God is a God of compassion, love, and patience? For the same reason that lovesick Jacob could be so easily duped and greedy Zacchaeus could betray his country and everything and everyone around him, they are blinded by their idols. When an idol gets a grip on your heart, it spins out a whole set of false definitions of success and failure and happiness and sadness. It redefines reality in terms of itself. Nearly everyone thinks that an all-powerful God of love, patience, and compassion is a good thing. But if your idol, 
your ultimate good is the power and status of your people, then anything that gets in the way of it is by definition bad. When God's love prevented him from smashing Israel's army, Jonah, because of his idol, was forced to see God's love as a bad thing. Listen to this. In the end, idols can make it possible to call evil good and good evil. Did you get that? In the end, idols can cause us, can make it possible to call evil good and good evil. Is there no better description of our current culture than that? Calling evil good and calling good evil. In this culture of cancel culture, have you noticed? Have you noticed what's happened over the last three to three, three or four or five years? It used to be that when someone apologized, someone repented of something that they had said or that they had done, we would forgive them no longer. No longer in this, in this culture of canceling others, if anyone has ever, ever made a mistake, they are all now, now as a culture, we are going to condemn them for their mistake from here to eternity. You see, it's a good thing, sisters and brothers, to forgive one another. But our culture has turned that which is good and they've made it into evil. Oh no, if we ever forgive someone, we are saying what they did was right. That's not true at all. You see, our our culture, our culture has this idol of, of self. Our culture doesn't have a God that is the one true God. No, not at all. The story continues. So Jonah is angry and he sets down, builds himself a, a shelter. And God causes a vine to grow up over that shelter and and give him shade from the heat of the day. And Jonah finally, Jonah finally, I, I, I I can just imagine it. He's sitting there on a hillside looking out over that city of Nineveh. I'm sure he's thinking in his heart, you know, maybe God will relent. Maybe God will relent from his grace. Maybe God's fire will rain down upon this evil city. He had shade for that evening. And the scripture says that that God caused a worm to come into that vine and eat up that vine. And and, and there was an east wind, a hot east. Here in Amarillo, we would call it a hot south wind. A hot south wind came in and wilted that ivy or that vine. and, And Jonah was there in the heat of the day, wishing that he had died yet again. And God replied to him, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night? And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? And then the story ends. Quite unsatisfying to me. (laughs) I want to know what happens to the rest of the story. I want to know what happens to Assyria. Well, we know what happens to Assyria. It appears as though the people did repent, but within just a couple of short years, they are not just knocking on the door of the northern tribes. They come in and they sweep through Israel and they slaughter thousands and thousands of people, take others into exile, they resettle that area, and they become the Samaritans that we know of in the New Testament in the life of Jesus. We also know a little bit about Jonah. Did he continue to be bitter? Did he continue to be proud? Did he continue to be angry that God had forgiven the Ninevites? Well, we have his words. (laughs) And let me tell you, someone who is humble enough to write those words about himself I think that probably uh, that Jonah found forgiveness for his own sins. You see, you see these hidden idols of self, these hidden idols of patriotism, these hidden idols even of our own religions. 
that will destroy us. These are idols that are, that are hidden from us, but when life gets tough, they begin to bubble up to the, to the surface. I believe the life of Jonah teaches us that it is one thing to believe the gospel in your head because he did do that. He, be, he, believed, he believed that God was a forgiving God in his head. He knew that God was a forgiving God. He had run from that forgiving God and then finally relented. He knew that gospel in his head. There's a difference, though, between knowing the gospel in your head and taking it into your heart. It's been said, it's been said by some that the, that the difference between, between heaven and hell is the difference between the eight, eight, 18 inches between your head and your heart. Some of us, some of us have the gospel only in our heads. And we have other gods before the, God, before the one true God. Dear sisters and brothers, take the gospel into your heart. Know that there is only one true God, and that is God through Jesus Christ. No longer worship yourself. No longer worship your culture. No longer even worship your religion but instead worship the one true God, Jesus the Christ. Would you bow with me? Oh God, indeed, there are many of us here today who are, who are running from a call of yours. We're running because we have other things that are first in our lives, things that oftentimes are hidden, things that we don't even recognize just like many years ago, God, I was so scared. I was so scared that you might call me to step out of, of being comfortable. I was so scared that you were going to call me into scary places, dangerous places. But God, you called me just the same. And you call each of us just the same to step out, to follow you at all costs, come what may. Oh God, you are calling us to follow you. And so Lord, on this day, we vow, we proclaim that we have no other gods before you. What you call us to do on this day, we will do who you call us to love on this day, we will love. We will worship you and you alone. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.